preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Now, as you look through, and you must have, as you look through this booklet, you'll notice that the emphasis throughout the entire series of programs this year is on Jewish values, and you may wonder why. Last year at the Y here, we conducted the first omnibus program, Jewish omnibus program, and the program dealt almost entirely with Jewish issues. And at practically every meeting, questions were raised regarding basic Jewish values. And every time the question was raised, the speaker would inevitably say, this question is too difficult to deal with in the course of the time allotted to me. And uh, people went away with a feeling that perhaps the speakers didn't know the answers. And so we felt that this year, we ought to lay the groundwork for an understanding of Jewish values so that at the end of the series, and if you will turn now to page five, where it says Jewish issues, we hope that those of us that survive until March 6th will have the opportunity to apply what we have learned throughout the entire series on Jewish values, apply this understanding to these Jewish issues, and there are three of them that we have selected. One is the status of women in Jewish law. The other, can a Jew live a full life outside of Israel? And the last, Toynbee and the Jews. And I hope that on that date, when we discuss Toynbee and the Jews on March 20th, when Maurice Samuel will be with us again, we'll have an opportunity to see who the stalwarts are who've been able to go through this entire series with us. And without more explanation, we'll have enough opportunity for discussion afterwards. I'd like to introduce a very distinguished guest that we have with us today, because we're inaugurating two programs, in a sense, tonight. One, the Jewish Omnibus, and the other, Jewish Book Month. And we're fortunate in being able to have with us tonight the chairman of the Jewish Book Council of America, Rabbi Eli Pilchik. Rabbi Pilchik. Mr. Chairman and good friends, survival is the key word in the vocabulary of nature. And survival, I take it, is the key motive uh, in the uh, raw animal makeup of man. And since Jews are an integral part of mankind, uh, survival has been uh, the key to their uh, experience. The question is, as one reviews Jewish history, the question is, since Jews have shown such remarkable proficiency and capacity to survive, under great pressure and persecution, uh, do they possess that same capability in an atmosphere of uh, prosperity and, uh, and freedom? Uh, that's the question before American Jewry today. Taking the question seriously, a number of people in various avenues of uh, Jewish life here <coughs> have identified themselves as uh, militant survivalists, if you will. 
and they have been working in the attempt to keep the Jew alive in the face of the comfort and the freedom and the, uh, the absence of uh, one of the great survival pass, uh, factors of the past. Among those groups is uh, the Jewish Book Council of America under the auspices of the Jewish Welfare Board, which is interested in promoting and stimulating and dramatizing of the Jewish book, the book by the Jewish author, the book of Jewish content, whether it be uh, the Jewish book of antiquity or the contemporaneous Jewish book. And so each year there is sponsored by this Jewish book council a Jewish book month, and we inaugurate that Jewish book month this evening. At the close of this lecture, you may be interested in going upstairs and seeing the exhibit in the library for Jewish Book Month. In most of the Jewish libraries of the country, there will be such exhibits and lectures and the like. And so uh, this Jewish Book Month attempts this survival, uh, this survival experiment. One of the key personalities in this struggle for Jewish survival has been the speaker of the evening. Maurice Samuel, one of the most literate Jews of the 20th century who believes in its survival, has gone and uh, looked into the literature of our people, the life of our people, and has attempted to present it particularly to the English reading public in various ways, novelistically, essayistically, critically. Indeed, in his uh, last work, he, uh, he plays the, uh, uh, the Rashi of the 20th century by giving a, a brilliant commentary on some of the biblical characters, the volume called Certain People of the Book. Among the things Mr. Samuel has done was to uh, breathe life into Yiddish literature, that heartwarming, pulsating literature which uh, kept us going so, uh, so wonderfully for three or four centuries in Europe and for part of the time here. This literature he has presented in his world of uh, Sholem Aleichem, in his superb translations of the works of uh, Sholem Ash and uh, I.J. Singer and some of the others. I know of no one better qualified to present to you the survival ingredients in the realm of Yiddish literature the values in Jewish life found in Jewish literature than our speaker of the evening, Mr. Maurice Samuel. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Kilchik, ladies and gentlemen, I take very seriously the challenge of my friend Mr. Freeman on this question of what are these famous Jewish values that we're always talking about and never defining. I accept the challenge and at the same time want to point out what a curious position we are in when Jewish values are no longer tacit. When the question, what is it to be Jewish and what is it to have Jewish values, is no longer something that is self-understood there's a song in Yiddish that some of you must have heard from time to time, which makes fun more or less of this deliberate, programmatic, and uh, intellectual attempt to say, what is a Jew? Remember that song, Was mir seinen seinen mir, ober Eden seinen mir. Was mir essen essen mir, ober Kugel essen mir. And so on and so on, deriding this intellectualist attempt to do something that the intellect can hardly do, 
What is it to be a Jew? What are the values which are involved in Jewishness? It's come to a rather bad pass when you have to start defining the essence of a corporate personality. One can't really define a personality. But to the extent uh, that uh, I can do it, I shall try this evening. Now, first of all, I want you to <clears throat> divest your minds of any notion that what I can give you in the course of this talk will actually reproduce the Jewish value. I shall have to skirt it. I shall have to point out differences between this and other values. But I won't be giving you the real value in itself, and you won't expect me to either. I can give you indications of where to seek it. I can sometimes tell you what it isn't. And especially in the course of a single evening's talk, of two or three hours, you won't expect me to provide you with a total inner feeling as to something which you haven't got, if you haven't got it. First, I want you to notice the difference between Yiddish literature about the Jews and English literature about the Jews. I'm going to leave the Hebrew out as a special case. Yiddish literature was written of the people for the people. And English literature about the Jews is written of the people for somebody else. The subject matter in the English books about Jews has nothing to do with those who read about that subject matter. Or at any rate, that is the case in about five-sixths of such books. Because five-sixths of the books that deal with Jewish life in the English language deal with a transitional generation with which we are no longer concerned in a living way. The other sixth, or maybe it's a fifth or a quarter, I don't know, is remote from the Jewish scene and is generally the literature of those who have escaped or who are in rebellion. Yiddish literature, however, was the literature about the people and was read by the people about whom it was written. And so it didn't need any explanations. When you write in English about the Jewish people, you've always got to introduce asterisks and footnotes or a glossary before or at the end because it's somebody else. But such is not the case in Yiddish. And this is already an indication of the difference between the tacit value which is inherent in a certain group and the value which is no longer tacit and has to be explained and delivered from the outside. Something else that you will notice about Yiddish literature and that is a tonality of life which is separated from the outside world. Separated from the outside world not merely because of the absence of a common vocabulary but the absence of a common experience and outlook. I would say that the fundamental difference between the tacit Jew, the tacit Jewish masses and those to whom Judaism is already intellectualized is that among the Yiddish masses there has always been a sense of the sanctity of human history. The Jews, doesn't matter how primitive they were in their intellectual processes, doesn't matter if they'd had nothing more than a cheder education and even a very poor cheder education, imbibed from the surrounding air the feeling that the history of this people, and therefore in a sense the history of the world, wasn't simply an accidental clashing of forces with patterns having no spiritual significance. To the Jew, Jewish history was a providential unfolding. The simplest Jew, for example, when he said Daid is in Golis, meant thereby there was a time when the Jew wasn't in Golis, and if the Jew was in Golis, it was for a period of suffering. And the period of suffering was connected with the imperfection of the Jews when they had their own land. 
and the restoration of the Jewish homeland is an act of the divinity in which there is inherent a plan and a purpose, the Welt is not Hefker. This is not the case with the simple people among other nations with which I've come in contact or have read about. Go out in America, in England, in Germany, in France, in Italy, among ordinary plain folk, they don't talk of the history of their people in terms of a divine plan. Something with a trajectory beginning in the remote past and already turning through the various lines, the various points of the curve, with a significance. Now, there are some writers and philosophers in the Christian world who do believe that human history has a purpose and that uh, the uh, various phases of the human condition, <clears throat> if plotted in a graph, as it were, would show the unfolding of the providential will. There are such philosophers, but it isn't something that has percolated through to the masses and isn't something even that's accepted by all philosophers. I would say that such philosophers are in a minority. And in any case, it is perfectly true to say that for the Jew, the study of the history of his people is a sacred obligation, whereas for others, it is a civic obligation. When a Jew learns Jewish history, going back to the remotest beginnings, going back to the pre-Jewish story of man, and through the coming of the faith, the patriarchs, Egypt, Palestine, the first exile, and then it goes on to the post-biblical period of the second state, the destruction of the second state, and then the literature which arose after that, the literature of the Mishnah and of the Talmud and uh, of the Responsa, the literature of the philosophers of medieval times, the long stretch of the commentators until today, when a Jew contemplates that, it is a sanctity. He is doing a religious act when he studies those things. Now, by no stretch of the imagination can it be said that when you're studying English history, beginning with the... Uh, coming of the Celts and the Jutes and Angles and Saxons and Danes and Normans, or when you study American history, in no sense can it be said that you are performing a religious duty. And this distinction is inherent in what we have to unfold and feel about Jewish values. Jewish values are sacred. I don't mean to say there are no sacred values in the non-Jewish world. But Jewish values are sacred through and through. And learning among Jews is a religious obligation. Whereas elsewhere it is an intellectual, a civic obligation. And this distinction is fundamental to the definition of the two worlds. Yiddish arose as one of the instruments of Jewish survival. And it's almost impossible to speak of Yiddish literature without a glance at the character of the Yiddish language. Yiddish is not, I suppose you all know by now, a German dialect. Yiddish is not simply a convenience, a lingua franca, which Jews invented and spread among themselves for purposes of international contact among themselves. Yiddish, with its admixture of Hebrew, Yiddish which developed the Hasidic literature, the Hasidic folk literature, in Yiddish, Hasidism became learned at a later stage, Yiddish is, in spite of itself, a sacred language. And it's quite remarkable to observe that the relationship to God in Yiddish 
is totally different from the relationship of, let us say, English, in order to examine the language with which we are all familiar. But this applies, I think, also to German, to French, and to Italian. In Yiddish, the Jew has created expressions in which the intimacy with the Rabboni Shalom exists side by side with a sense of the eternal and the ungraspable. Now the word Rabboni Shalom, the phrase Rabboni Shalom means judge of the world, judge of the universe. It's an exalted title. Or a Jew, a Jew will say in simple Yiddish, there was late edik, he that lives eternally. And in the same sentence or in the adjacent sentence, he can turn and say, gotten you, taught you. He becomes at once the child and the intimate. And there is sometimes even an impertinent relationship to the Almighty. Among the Hasidim, Yiddish became the instrument of a give and take, which to the outside world with its formalized sense of the awfulness of the creator of the universe is akin to blasphemy and certainly it is shocking at first contact i think many of you familiar are familiar with those stories of hasidic life in which certain rabbis cite the almighty before a court they hail him before a court or rather let me say they hold a court and they don't have to hail him because he's everywhere anyhow and uh, they accuse him of dealing unjustly with human beings. Of course, I needn't tell you that it doesn't make much difference in the last analysis, and that in the end they are compelled to admit that he is, the, he is in the right, but they do challenge him, and it flows quite naturally in Yiddish, where it would not even in Hebrew, and certainly not in English. Now, one has to understand this about Yiddish, in order to know that this intimacy with God, and number two, this sense of the divinity of history, is part of Yiddish literature, and is not found elsewhere in anything remotely approaching the same degree. And thus you haven't got, or you hardly have, in Yiddish literature, art for art's sake. Somebody who sings but as the limits do, who sings simply because he feels something toward the universe and he's detached from his people, he utters a universal song in which the Jewish element or theme does not appear. Something else follows in consequence for Yiddish literature, a sense of responsibility toward the people, which is bound up with this tacit rejection of the idea of art for art's sake. Every one of the famous, the distinguished, the gifted Yiddish writers have had a profound sense of responsibility toward the Jewish people. And this you may perhaps summarize in the following fashion. Other peoples have a land. And because they have a land, the plastic element in their experience and in their expression of experience has to do with nature itself. It is not so in Yiddish. The Jew was detached from nature because for the last thousand years he has been systematically excluded from the soil. And therefore the festivals and the harvests and all those elements of life which depend upon this contact with the soil, all these things were absent from the Jewish experience, and it is reflected, as I frequently insist, in the poverty of Jewish expressions for natural phenomena. But also it created something else. It created among the Jews a substitute for this life of the soil. It created the Jewish festive relationship to a soil which they no longer possess. The ritual of the Jewish holidays is geared seasonally to Palestine. Our prayers for rain, for the Yora and Malkush, for the former and the latter rains, are meaningless in 
the temperate zone in which most Jews live. There are no former and latter rains in America or in England. The former rain is something that comes in October. The latter rain is something that comes in February or March. Both of these are needed for a prosperous harvest. So the Jew goes on praying for a former and a latter rain when maybe his neighbors don't want any rain. Or they've got too much rain, as in certain areas of India. They're praying the rain should stop. He goes on obstinately praying for the former and the latter rain. It will listen. The Jewish festivals have to do with the seasons in Palestine, in Israel. And the time of the Thanksgiving, the time of the Sukkah, all these are distinct, severed from the surrounding world. So where other literatures are regionalist in the geographic sense, the Jewish literature has to be regionalist in the conceptual sense. That is to say, where others sing of nature itself and of the soil and the mountains and the valleys and the meadows and the streams. And there it is, three-dimensional and palpable. And that constitutes, so to speak, their patriotism. I don't mean in the political sense, and I don't mean in the vulgar sense. I mean the patriotism of love for one's surroundings and one's circumstances. Where a Thomas Hardy sings, as it were, of Wessex, and where a Scott sings of, Walter Scott sings of Scotland, the Jew must sing of the Jewish festivals because that's the Jewish territory. That is the place where the Jew lives himself out and has lived himself out for these last 2,000 years. And the consequence is that a serious Jewish writer cannot indulge in those flights of fancy in which he, as it were, repudiates his people because he wouldn't be repudiating it if he were a guy. Let us say an Englishman writes... In the purely natural sense, like Tennyson in his poetry, of the English valleys, the English mountains, nothing to do with the English people. The fact that it's of England that he sings, and he mentions those places, and you can tell from the flowers and the trees, from the product of the fields and the orchards, you can tell you're in England, enables him to dispense with being a patriotic Englishman. He is patriotic by the mere fact of producing values in the English language about English surroundings. But since the Jew hasn't got those surroundings or hadn't those surroundings, the only way he could be serious and could be tied to his people was by sticking to the text, as it were, of the festivals. Now take all these elements together. Take this Jewish sense of intimacy with God. Take this Jewish feeling of History being a providential process and not a series of accidents. Take further this necessity of expressing oneself Jewishly, not by means of the mamoshistic, not by means of the three-dimensional and the tangible, but by means of the ideas which we have carried through life. And you begin to see where Yiddish literature has to transmit Jewish values. Now, these alone are not Jewish values. And I shall not be giving you all Jewish values, as I remarked at the beginning. But interwoven with these, there is the concept in this serious outlook of the Jew, as expressed in Yiddish literature, there is the concept deriving from the Bible of a life, a human life, which has a meaning also in itself. And again, it's bound up with the absence of the nature theme. In Yiddish literature, the natural in the sense of the animal is also absent. That is why you haven't got a Yiddish literature of the erotic. There is erotic literature in all languages except the Yiddish. That is too much of nature. That is too much of the animal for the Jew. You haven't got a Yiddish literature of combat. In all the literatures of the Western world, you've got the picture of knighthood, 
You've got the glorification of the warrior. You have the lyric of the slaughter, it might be called. When to kill human beings under certain circumstances is done with a gallantry and with a flourish and with a zest and a grace which apparently lifts it out of the realm of murder. Yiddish literature hasn't got that tonality. And you won't express it in Yiddish. You can't change into any equivalent terms in Yiddish, let us say the Arthurian cycle, with the battles and the ringing of swords on armor. You can't produce a Robin Hood in Yiddish. You can't produce a Claude Duval. You can't produce these romantic figures of the buccaneers and the pirates. You can't produce those medieval Bertrand du Guesclin, these famous knights and paladins. You can't produce it in Yiddish because in the absence of the emotion, a terminology wasn't created. First of all, if you started to explain in Yiddish all the variations of the poetical ways of contemplating murder, contemplating the slaughter of a human being, you wouldn't have the instruments. You'd have to start explaining what is a mace and what is a falchion and what is chain mail and what is a helm and what is a cask. You can get by a bow and arrow you've got in Yiddish and you've got a sword and one or two other simple primitive instruments for the separation of the human soul from the human body. But you haven't got that immense range which enables the English or the French or the German or the Italian singer of slaughter to make it picturesque. There's no picturesque killing in Yiddish. The Jew knew. Sometimes you fight. Sometimes you kill and get killed. Mostly you got killed. But his valor was not of the combative type. His heroism was of the passive type. And a French phrase like mort sur le champ d'honneur, dead upon the field of glory, upon the field of honor, just can't be translated into Yiddish, just as you cannot translate into English some Yiddish phrase like uh, a gemora. You cannot say in English Arangchappen. You can say, I will study a page of philosophy. I will hear a lesson on it. But to snatch it, to grab it, as though it were some delicious morsel, does not belong in English or in any other language that I know except Yiddish. This reflects the fundamentally serious attitude of the Jew on this matter of life and death and what to him seemed to be the fundamentally frivolous attitude of the outside world. Shalom Aleichem, in one of his letters to Mendele, explaining how and for what reason he wrote his novel, Stempenu, which comes nearest to a sort of a love theme in Yiddish, in the romance sense, said to Mendele, who was his teacher, who was the teacher of the whole subsequent generations of Jewish writers, we haven't got that type of romanticism in Yiddish. The love that flourishes, and of course it did flourish between man and woman, between boy and girl in the Yiddish-speaking world, was of a more sober and perhaps of a more enduring kind. But the glamour idea, the idea of the princess who sits above the lists and the knights juiced for her, a maiden fair to see, a pearl of minstrelsy, for whom proud nobles sigh and with each other vie to do her menial's duty, that doesn't exist in Yiddish. And as you haven't got that, just so haven't you got the attendant circumstances which have to do with valor and with combat and the only valor and the combat which the Jew recognized was that which was soberly assumed and praised above all and treasured above all the power of endurance. Go through the work of the three classicists in Yiddish literature. 
and you discover that nowhere, neither in Mendele, nor in Peretz, nor in Shalom Aleichem, have you got a single one of those figures which are, as it were, the regular routine foundation of romantic literature among the Goyim. You haven't got any of those flourishes, the bravados and the bravura of human behavior, which to the outside world seem to constitute the greatest charm in literature. What you have instead everywhere is the constant sounding of the notes which have to do with the preservation of our intellectual, spiritual territory, not having a physical territory. And what always captivated the simple Jewish masses, apart from the intellectualist Yiddish reader, was what sounded the note of our history, of our religion, of the ritual, and of all those cultural values which were interwoven with each of these areas. Perhaps the most successful of the popular writers and creators was one who doesn't stand at the top like Mendela and Shalom Aleichem and Peretz, but Goldfaden, who until recently was the darling of the Jewish masses. Some have called him the Jewish Stephen Foster. His melodies are still sung everywhere, and his operettas, though they are not by any means in the, first, uh, in the first rank of opera, nevertheless have had a profound effect upon Jewish life and mirror best what it is in Yiddish literature that the masses look for. You know, we all still sing a pastor as a molgevein in dem land Canaan, and we still sing, if you remember, in dem beis amigdash and avinkel acheder, zitz di almona bastion alein, we still sing those songs and we still feel that Yiddish literature hasn't got any substance unless this coloration deepened by, as it were, crystal transparency of centuries is in them. And again, I can perhaps best bring this out by contrasting it with what you haven't got in the literature of English. Some time ago, while preparing a series of lectures on American Jewish literature and the picture of Jewish life which emerges from the English books in this country on Jewish life, I had occasion to reread books that I hadn't looked at for many years. One of them was Abe Kahn's Rise of David Levinsky, and another was a book which made quite a stir in its day, A Peculiar Treasure by... Edna Ferber. And this last one I cite in particular because it points up the contrast which I am trying to present. Edna Ferber discovered about Hitler's time that she was very Jewish. She reacted strongly, as the psychologists say. And she had to give expression to her pride of being a Jew. And she wrote this book, The Peculiar Treasure, and she put at the head of the book the following quotation as indicating her view on Judaism. This is the slogan of the book taken from Exodus chapter 19. Now therefore if ye will obey my voice and keep my covenant then shall ye be a peculiar treasure unto me and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Those are crucial words from the Bible. So when you read the book, you expect to find there some echo of this sentiment and some appreciation of the relation of this sentiment to her feeling about Judaism and the contents of Judaism. The fact is she knows nothing at all about Judaism. To say, no, that isn't putting it correctly. She has a sort of antipathy to knowing. She seems to stand off from it warily. And you find passages like this, which I copied out, I'd forgotten them. I was stupefied when I came across them again. 
It has always been my contention that the Jew left in peace for 200 years throughout the world would lose his aggressiveness, his tenacity, and his neurotic ambition would be completely absorbed and would vanish as a type from the face of the earth. So all that Judaism consists of to her, who wrote this book about the peculiar treasure, is aggressiveness, tenacity, and neurotic ambition. That's all that she finds of intrinsic value in being Jewish. Or again she says, thus for centuries we have been saved from complete absorption by such fanatics, megalomaniacs, or perverts as Pharaoh, Hitler, Ivan of Russia, Philip of France, and Edward I of England. And then finally, in a burst of insight, she writes as follows. Adolf Hitler has done more to solidify and to spiritualize the Jews of the world than any other man since, you'll never guess, Moses. <laughs> since Moses. Wie gefällt euch der Vergleich? How do you like this comparison? Moses and Hitler, the two great sustaining forces in Jewish life. And she points out to spiritualize the Jew. Now, it's easier to understand what I'm driving at in this content of Yiddish literature if you take a series of quotations like that or if you take hold of the large majority, the large majority of Jewish books in English. Some of them have a little literary merit, some considerable literary merit, say Augie March by Saul Bellows. Some of you must be familiar with it. It's of good a literary standard. It's about a Jewish world. Nothing Jewish in it whatsoever, except if you happen to know phrases here and there and customs, you see, oh, those are Jews apparently, nothing Jewish. Worse than that, a book, let us say, like the one that's now creating such a tempest in a teapot, Marjorie Morningstar, in which the author seems to be the, under the impression that Judaism consists of an abhorrence of pork and a determination to retain your virginity. <laughs> and that the, that the loss of your virginity hardly ranks higher in the scale of sin than your first taste of shrimp. I've read that book with some astonishment, wondering where in this apparent devotion to Jewish values I would find some hint, some glint or glimmer of what is this Jewish thing. In the end, Marjorie Morningstar, in spite of her one lapse uh, in a Goyish restaurant, and in a Jewish bed, in spite of one lapse, she recovers her purity, her Yiddishkeit, and her fertility, becomes a mother of four in the suburbs, is held up as the paragon for Jewish women to imitate, and what it's all about, nobody knows. <laughs> Where in the one field there was a tacit understanding of what it was to be Jewish, and the other, there is a tacit repudiation of the desire to understand or to investigate. Never mind what Judaism is. Just don't you eat pork and krishna go with it and uh, go and live in the suburbs and have four children and belong to a synagogue and belong to a hadassah. But what this means is not for you to investigate. This strange obscurantism is something that points up as nothing else could have done. The contrast between a world where it was felt and the contrast in the world where it dare not, the contrast with a world where it dare not be examined. If you were to ask me, what is the element in Yiddish literature which comes out most strongly, I would answer that the miracle of the transposition of ancient values originally expressed in Hebrew, their transposition into a language and into a world of circumstance that was never dreamed of by those that first crystallized the Jewish consciousness. I think it was Professor, yes, it was Professor Heschel in his book, The Earth is the Lord's, 
who spoke of Yiddish having produced values not less profound and not less significant than those of the prophets. He was referring to the life of Eastern Jewry as symbolized by the Hasidim. Now, that this can be said by a scholar of the first rank, and that this can be supported, I don't know whether I would subscribe to it completely, confronts us with the strange miracle of a transposition of values, not a transva transvaluation of them, but a transposition of values out of the Bible into a modern world in which the biblical circumstance no longer existed. What was said at Sinai and what was preached by the prophets on the hills of Judea and in Israel finds a perfect echo in the Yiddish literature. The attitude of seriousness toward life. The attitude of a belief that man is not here simply as the consequence of a fortuitous concourse of atoms, and that history is not, as Gibbon said, largely the record of the follies and crimes of mankind, but that there is a purpose. And that in this Yiddish literature, the echo of that original outlook first made manifest and articulate in the hills and valleys of Palestine, subsisted without any substantial change in the swarming ghettos of Krakow and Lemberg and Warsaw and Odessa in a language which would have been fantastic to the conception of those of the old time, would have been fantastic even to one of the Middle Ages like the Rambam. Now, I don't know, ladies and gentlemen, whether I've conveyed any solid notion of what Jewish values are. I've referred to them tangentially. I've implied them. But these values, and I hope that the implication has at least contacted some predisposition in you, these values echo in Yiddish literature as they do not in English or French or other modern literatures and do not in the same way in modern Hebrew literature, which is returning, still groping, to the very first form. We mustn't forget that Yiddish is one of the remarkable episodes in human history because it is not only a fascinating language in itself and not only intrinsically has it got literary and spiritual significance, it is also the key to the manner in which the Jews have survived during the last 2,000 years. This Yiddish is a language which resembles in its purpose and in its manner the Judeo-Aramaic, the Judeo-Arabic, the Judeo-Spanish, which is Spaniolo, and therefore affords us a glimpse into the manner in which Jews used to take material from the surrounding world, make it Yiddish, and compel it, as it were, to levy a contribution to Jewish life. Yiddish is the key to the episode of our survival during 2,000 years. I don't mean to say it explains where we got the will, but it does give us the manner in which we operated. We operated by absorbing from the surrounding world, remolding, remodeling, and turning it into Jewish values. And in this sense, Yiddish as a language, mirroring as it does the whole experience of the Jewish people in the exile, Yiddish as a language and therefore as a literary mode is peculiar and incorporates in itself the will of the Jew to survive. To write in Yiddish, to write what is acceptable as Yiddish, to write in that tone which until recently in Yiddish literature captivated the masses, is to demonstrate the adaptability of the Jew and his ingenuity in taking from the surrounding world 
modes and methods of self-expression and self-perpetuation. Yiddish, of course, is no longer the mass medium that it was, but it will remain for a long, long time a vitally important part of Jewish life, and the knowledge of it will be essential to a thorough understanding of the Jewish ethos and the Jewish experience. The time will perhaps come when it will become merely a learned language. It will be the possession of the highly cultured and no longer of the masses. And by that time, Hebrew may have taken over the functions of Yiddish as the survival medium, linguistically speaking, of the Jewish people. But until then, a study of Yiddish and an appreciation of its literature opens up not only an insight into what the Jewish ethos was, its profound seriousness, its adult attitude as compared with what might, I think, not unfairly be called the adolescent attitude of the outside world. It also opens up some sort of insight into the will of the Jews under the most adverse and discouraging circumstances to endure not just for survival, but for the purpose of continuing to express those ancient values. If there's anything that I find distressing in this rage for the word survival, if there's in it an element of the negative, it is its apparent evasion of the reason for survival. Survival is not a trick. It has been found by some of the lowest forms of life. I understand from the biologists that it is the oyster, which as a form of life is about 200 million years old, which has best solved the problem of survival. The ant, a much higher form of life, has also existed for a long time. Among the larger land animals, the turtle is distinguished by its antiquity and by its probable survival into the future, unless Jews become over fond of turtle soup. But I don't think we look to any of these forms for the secret of the élan vital of the vital thrust. And this excessive emphasis on the survival aspect of Judaism is something that I would like to sound a warning against. It isn't just a question of surviving in what Toynbee because the fossilized form, in the taboo forms which Marjorie Morningstar incorporates. Not a question of survival. It is a question of continuity of creation. Yiddish is distingu distinguished by the fact that it found new forms of expression for the old values. There are things in Yiddish which could not have been said in Hebrew and can't be translated into Hebrew, can't be translated into English. And there will be forms in Hebrew that we can't anticipate today. But Yiddish, which once embraced numerically a far larger number and held together linguistically a far larger number than any other language, was spoken and read felt in by 11 million Jews only 30 years ago, Yiddish is one of the illustrations not simply of the survival capacity of the Jew, but of his enormous talent for new spurts of creation. And the study of that literature, independently of its merits and of its intrinsic beauties, is a study in a capacity which no other people has been able to demonstrate. And it's from these multiple points of view that I invite you to become adepts in Yiddish and cognizant with its literature. <clears throat> I've got these pencils here to take registrations for a Yiddish class, which will begin tomorrow. But that's no joke because, uh, as I pointed out at the beginning, the character of this series, of this Jewish omnibus series, evolved from the series that we had last year. And it's quite possible that a class in Yiddish literature might develop out of this. 
Now, um, we come to the question period, and I've got some cards here and some pencils for those people who would rather write their questions. Uh, is there anyone who would rather write his question? You want to raise your hand? We have a card, pencils. Now, um, you've had a few seconds to formulate your questions, or is there anyone who would like to make a point without a question? You do have one? Yes. Sure, go ahead. Uh, well, if you want to ask questions, get up direct them to the audience so I won't have to repeat them. And we can proceed yeah, more of it. I would like to ask you, when you say there is not a comparable seriousness in the English literature, for instance, with the seriousness of the uh, Yiddish literature, aren't you not limiting it more or less to the forms of fiction? You yes, I've dealt... You don't mean philosophy or, uh, or other uh, discursive... That's quite correct. That's quite correct. I've yes. been speaking this evening. I should have prefaced my remarks by that. Uh, classification, largely of what we call creative literature, not of philosophy, which is, of course, a branch of literature, not of the essay, but of what is accepted by the large masses as literature, uh, namely, descriptions of life in the form of the novel. And there, I would say that my distinction holds not that in the form of the novel you won't find either very serious uh, areas, but I think it's fair to say that the literatures of the non-Jewish peoples are marked by what the Jew called a frivolity, but which I would call a gamesomeness and the feeling of the playfulness of life, which is absent from the Jewish. Playfulness about the most serious things. When they say playing the game, they may mean on the battlefield or they may mean in disaster, in calamity, but they call it playing the game. Life is a game. Yes, George Eliot is in the other direction. Nevertheless, I would say of George Eliot that, for example, um, her uh, character of Tito Melema in uh, Romola couldn't have been drawn by a Jew. You remember the character of that uh, sort of a scoundrel? Uh, well, I would say that that kind of character could not have been drawn by a Jew and that life which he describes of Renaissance Italy wouldn't have fitted into, a, a Jew, into Jewish surroundings. But of course, you're right, there are these novelists who do stand uh, closer to our area than to theirs. I'm simply characterizing the thing as a whole without thereby, as it were, compromising every single section of it. Yes. Well, 
to show that he was the father of Dr. Jacob and Mr. Hall, the protector's analogy, on the one hand, he loved him. Yes, well, now, are you? Slaughter, and on the other, he was so humble. Yeah. Yes. Well, you might have uh, chosen Kipling very correctly for another reason. I don't know this story that you describe, but certainly if you wanted somebody who is at the other extreme from the Jewish outlook, it's Kipling. Kipling's famous, you remember, is if. All those, if you can run the unforgiving minute, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, Yours is the world and everything that's in it. And what is more, you'll be a man, my son, like Kipling. That's what he's always implying. Or his Gunga Din. Though I've whipped you and I've flayed you by the living God that made you, you're a better man than I am, Gunga Din. But I'll whip you and I'll flay you again just the same. Because I'm an Englishman and you're a, uh, a sepoy, whatever you are. Or you remember his famous line, he says, put me somewhere east of Suez, where the best is like the worst, and there ain't no Ten Commandments, and a man can raise a thirst. The chutzpah of it, it was just east of Suez, it was just east of Suez that the Ten Commandments were given. If you know the map, say, so put me somewhere east of Suez, where there ain't no Ten Commandments. Well, he was, of course, the Pukka Sahib par excellence, the Skipling. Uh, to him, God was a Scotch engineer, and uh, what mattered was... Be a man, my son. Play the man. East is east and west. What is it? And two strong men. But, but east, but there is neither east nor west, bar that are border nor bar nor birth, when two strong men stand face to face, though they come from the ends of the earth. Of course, the two strong men were two Kiplings. One of them an Englishman, and one of them a, uh, an Indian. But to that particular story, I don't know. What do I think of it? This isn't it good? I don't know what I think of it. I don't agree with it. <laughs> Can you please give us examples of Yiddish idioms and words that cannot be easily translated into English? That's number one. Well, I'll give you one. I'll give you one, an idiom to end all idioms. The description of a Jew who is a shatchen, a batchen, a ganaf, a lamb, a yid. Pardon? Slower. A shatchen, a batchen, a ganaf, a lamb, a yid. A shatchen is a wedding jester. A shatchen is a marriage broker. A batchen is a wedding jester. A ganaf is a rascal. A lamb is a scholar and he's a Jew. And, by the way, notice, uh, there are values in these things. And he is a scholar. He is a, obviously not a successful person. But even in, on this level, there is the introduction of the element of scholarship. But uh, this would lead me too far afield uh, to start giving you these idioms. But can you give us examples in Yiddish literature of taking in local institutions ideas, customs, and making them Jewish, say, in Russia, U.S., Poland, etc.? You find this most in Mendele, in which you frequently come across Russian words and Russian customs, but the transference of those Goyish elements into the Yiddish world took place before the flowering of Yiddish literature at a time when Yiddish literature was anonymous. In the days of the Bevis stories, by the way, you've all of you heard the expression Bobomysis, as most of you think it means grandmother stories. It doesn't. The stories of Bevis, it was the name of a man whose book of stories appeared about 500 years ago in Yiddish, and ever since then stories in Yiddish were called Bevis Mises, which became corrupted into Baba Mises. Now the transference of those forms into Yiddish took place long before the literature which we know as Yiddish today was yet uh, set down and printed. But uh, you find in Shalom Aleichem, contacts with the Goyish world. You find in Peretz, even in the story of Oibnisht Noch Hecher. You remember the rabbi disguises himself as a peasant in order to bring this woman in the, in the hut, the, the uh, sick woman, on the morning before, Rosh, uh, on the days before Rosh Hashanah. But that is 
carries us much too far afield. Pardon? Uh, in the ten days before Yom Kippur, between the between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. No, wait, I must uh, give others a chance. Yes, sir. Yes, quite clear. Theoretically, there is hardly any difference, theoretically, between the behavior and the outlook of a good Jew, a good Catholic, a good Protestant, theoretically. But what do you find in the actual education of the young? If a Jewish child gets a predominantly or an exclusively Jewish education, he learns from the beginning that the history of his people is divine. Is that correct? Does a Catholic child? No, we know it doesn't because your child goes to a Catholic or a Protestant school. Those children go to school. And unless they go to a parochial school with a strong religious streak in it, they don't learn those things. And the fact is that although in theory every Sunday they're told God is the, the, uh, the uh, molder and the director of the world, they don't study history under the rubric of a religious concept, which is the answer to what you ask, namely that there is not that same literal translation of God's interference in human affairs when carried into the history of one's people. Theoretically, your case is right, there is no difference. In practical fact, it remains the truth that to read Jewish history is to read something sacred, and to read American, French, or German history is to read something which is considered secular, and which you do six days in the week. On the seventh, you are told in church that God is the director of human affairs. The other six days of the week, when you sit for examinations in college or in high school, you don't say, and God said that for this and this reason, this people should be thus and thus. You say that, it happened that that people was stronger, this people was rising, that people was declining, and God doesn't appear in any of these transactions. But the study of Jewish history makes the continuous reference to God inescapable. Yes. The purpose of the survival was whether it was expressed in specific dogmatic terms or merely felt in the human, general human terms. The purpose was the fulfillment of human destiny in a messianic millennium. That the human species is not going to disappear without this perfection for which it was, pre, for which it was created and which is preordained. The concept of Mashiach Satan among simple Jews was a daily thing. Now you didn't, you don't hear, here again you have the difference. You don't hear Christians, simple Christians, I don't, just an ordinary, a cab driver, a, um, a plumber, a factory worker. You don't hear him saying Mashiach Satan. The concept of a Messiah is to him something that belongs only to the church the Messiah was, the Messiah may come again, but to the ordinary simple Jew, the concept of the imminence of a Messiah, the perfection of the human species, the transposition of human affairs beyond the historical, the post-historical stage, is perfectly natural. It's currency. The simplest Jewish housewife knows what you mean by Mashiach Satan. But you don't know it in the other languages. What, what is the uh, activity or the purpose of the survival of the Jewish people for this purpose? I mean, what 
I mean, how much do they, how much do they contribute, you mean, to the perfection of humanity? I don't know. I, it, 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 that's a question that can be investigated and debated endlessly. I'm merely saying, what are the concepts by which they live? Now, whether the Jew has contributed significantly or has not contributed significantly to the improvement of mankind or to the approach of a messianic era is a matter for itself. It would not invalidate the Jewish outlook if the Jew had not affected human history. Supposing human history had not been influenced by the existence of the Jew. That argues neither for nor the outlook of the Jew. I am describing this evening what the Jewish outlook is and how it has found expression in Yiddish. Now whether it has done something for the world or hasn't done something for the world is a chapter or a series of chapters for itself. Yes? Wait a moment, not while there is. Yes? Well, they have much more in common than they have separating them, but I would say this. Technically speaking, Peretz was the first one to modernize Yiddish in literary form. He did for Yiddish what Chaucer did for the English language. He is the well of Yiddish undefiled, as Chaucer is the well of English undefiled. But more than that, he set a permanent stamp on the mission of the Jewish writer. It's interesting, I observed before something about the seriousness of Jewish writers. All of them were conscious of being public servants. They had a contract with the public. They had a responsibility. They were teachers. In fact, Peretz and Mendele, Mendele I, were literally teachers. They wrote pedagogical books in Yiddish, sometimes in Hebrew. They wanted to improve the condition of the masses. And their literary work was a sort of super, a work of super erogation on top of their work as uh, responsible pedagogues of the Jewish people. But to differentiate between them, I would say that, uh, in, in another area, I would say that, Peret, that Mendel, the first of them, was the brutal castigator of the Jews. It's impossible to translate, or I find it impossible, have found it till now impossible to translate Mendel into English because he is pitiless with the weakness of the Jews. He is full of the most brutal satirical pictures of Jewish life. De Klatsche, the old mare, the story of an old mare in which he symbolizes the Jewish people, the old mare that everybody rides and kicks and exploits and starves until it's nothing but a, a bag of bones and hide. And in his Fischke der Krummer, which is a picture of the Jewish underworld of beggars, thieves, pimps, rascals generally, or his... Uh, still more satirical journeys of Benjamin the third, Masus bin Yaman Ashlishi, in which he describes the miserable condition of the little Jewish townlet with its schnorrers and its clay kredish and uh, with its uh, takifim and with its negidim and with its kapsonim and with its malodorous and, uh, and unsanitary homes, a brutal picture such as no anti-Semite could ever equal except that he wrote out of an agony of love and the anti-Semite writes out of hatred and contempt. Untranslatable. For that reason, at the present time, certainly. And Peretz, although he was capable of great satire and wrote some fine satirical pieces, was at his deepest in his folkloristic feeling for the Jews. A strange thing about Peretz was that fundamentally he was a modern intellectual with a knowledge of many European languages and the ability to write in the style of a Goethe or of a Heine, not with their genius, I don't pretend that for a moment, but his Beinacht of an Alten Mark is almost an echo of the Walpurgisnacht of, of, the, second, uh, of the first part of uh, Faust. And there are many places where he echoes the Heine satire. But his greatest work is in the 
deeply moving Hasidic stories which he thought were only as it were peripheral productions of his things that were I won't say playthings but done in moments of rest between his more serious enterprises those are immortal the Hasidic stories and the folk stimlechemises Shalom Aleichem was a natural troubadour of the people Shalom Aleichem was by far the greatest of those geniuses uh, didn't have any program he was steeped in the Jewish people and he expressed it without seeking to it when you read Shalom Aleichem it's as though you were listening to an anonymous voice he is the only one of the writers of whom I can think that it doesn't have to be by somebody this is the people speaking having found a perfect channel and there is a bewitching element in his Yiddish that you don't find somewhere else and he expresses this temper of the Jewish people better than the others because uh, he didn't have any of the conscious seriousness he was serious all right but he wasn't so to speak serious uh, every time he sat down to the desk I'll give you a little instance of his one of my favorite passages in uh, Shalom Aleichem has to do with the horse when old Tevye de Milchiker after all his life of frustration and uh, wretchedness and the tragedies of all of his daughters decides to sell off his little bit of Balabatishkate and move to, to Palestine he goes to sell his horse and this is how he describes it Gornet ot mir nit azoi tiv der lang wie wenn sie gekommen zu verkaufen mein Pferd azoi viel joren zusammen geschwitzt zusammen gebildet und jetzt nehmen verkaufe zu der Wasserträger verkaufen ob ich es verkaufe zu der Wasserträger weil von die Balagolos keine Norme wusse werden ich komme zu sehen mit meinem Pferd und sage Gott ist mit der Kreptedie das ist das Pferd sage ich wo denn das ist ein Hänglachter sage ich das ist nicht kein Pferd das ist nicht kein Hänglachter das ist ein das ist ein Lamet Wovnik sage ich was heißt ein Lamet Wovnik sage ich das ist ein Bocher von 36 Jahren und ein Simmel von der Zone und tresselt mit den Seiten wie bei Eden auf einem Frost wie gefällt der Kabbala Galoloschen ich sage ich als mein Bocher hat verstanden jedes Wort weil wenn sie gekommen zum Tekias Kaff und Verkäufen hat er ausgedreht sie mir die Kinderdicke Morde gleich wie er wird mir Gewalt sagen Kizach El Kimichol Amoli this is my portion in all my labor and I tell you that Shalom Aleichem is the only writer I know who could make a horse talk Hebrew and sound natural <laughs> and sound and sound natural <laughs> now all the pathos all the pathos of Jewish life and the seriousness of the Tsar Balechayim of of compassion toward animals is expressed in that passage it's a humorous passage and behind that humorous passage there is always the shimmer of tears he did this with a naturalness and with a sort of off-handedness that you don't find in the other writers parents could do it it would be sophisticated and ingenious and it could be done by Mendele directly and brutally but this twinkle of the eye this charm this bewitching element of the folk you find most strongly in Shalom Aleichem now that's a very brief and wholly unsatisfactory differentiation between them but that's all I can give you in the time at my disposal Are you forgetting it, huh? <laughs> yeah. Again, I'll ask you a question, but may not have to do with you and Edward, but I feel it's a new tragedy. If I remember a little of the things I read when I was little, the God said after the uh, novel that you would no more wipe off living beings off the earth, and that this should be due to leave, that we as Jews should fear not anything of uh, an atomic catastrophe which is ascending now on the world scene. Uh, well, excuse me if I uh, answer with Graham Stram, Machmer, Aletnik. I'm sorry, I just don't see the connection between the two, and uh, you don't pinpoint a subject. You see, I'm talking in general values, and I'm talking the general values embedded in Yiddish literature. Now you want me to say something where I believe as a Jew that God having promised we wouldn't be drowned, 
He also promised it wouldn't be burned. It is not certainly. Pardon? I will no more send the flood, he said, for while there is harvest and for the imagination of man is evil from his youth. And he would no more destroy all living things on the earth. But he also said in the prophets that the terrible, terrible day of God is coming when man will flee into the clefts of the rocks. No, don't, don't get hold of a text and try and make it uh, something uh, firm and, uh, and permanent uh, and covering all. Uh, and besides, to tell you the truth, I, I don't see how I can chepper on this subject for my talk of this evening. I'm, try, I'm, trying very, I'm trying very hard, but I'm not succeeding. So if somebody has a question which is more relevant, I'd be grateful for it. Uh, yes, ma'am. Excuse me, I'll come to yours next. Yes? He did in his early books. In his later books, he became one of those writers who, in Yiddish, was writing a kind of a Goyish language. I'm not being um, critical in the literary sense here. He wanted to reach the non-Jewish world. He had a message for it. And his Yiddish took on another tonality. He was serious. There was a Jewish intent in it. There was certainly a Jewish intent, I think, in the Nazarene and St. Paul. I don't think it was for in Mary. In Mary, he already went off, I think, in the last book he went off. But uh, in his early books, particularly in the Shtetl and in Motya Ganov, and particularly, by the way, in the Tilimid, he was in the authentic line of Yiddish literature. Later on, he was writing a Goyish language in Yiddish, and it didn't yield the same values as the early books. What is your question, sir? Yes? Yes, but they were called Bevis stories. Bocher is the name of the... Uh, is another name for him, but they were always called Bevis Mices and became Bubba Mices from that remark. The Bubba was his original name. There, there may be two of them, a Bevis and a Bocher. There was a Bocher who was also one of the writers of that time, about uh, 1500, 1480 to 1500, and Bevis. Yes? Yes? Uh, stand up and ask the question. If I recall correctly, you said that the... Eliyahu, excuse me, Eliyahu Bocher. Yeah. That's right. That uh, the Jew, or in Yiddish, you didn't have the writer who wrote art for art's sake. And now, I don't know whether what my interpretation of what you said followed, but you said that for this reason they did not write in universal terms. No, no, no. Well, I want to know yeah. whether I missed Now, that. yes, it's an important question. They didn't write art for art's sake, by which I mean to say that they didn't simply express their own souls, irrespective of what might be the consequences. They felt the responsibility toward the people, and they took their material from the people and wrote for the betterment of the people consciously. Now, their universal values, and Shalom Aleichem has universal values, so has Peretz, and so has Mendele, their universal values arose from their treatment of this material. There are universal values. I mentioned Thomas Hardy before. Thomas Hardy deals predominantly with the people of the Wessex country. It's a small world. It's a parochial world. Little people. But out of this small world and these little people, he produces universal values. The same way as Scott does out of his border tales, apart from his historical romances which are placed elsewhere. The Jew did the same thing, just as the Jew in ancient times in that tiny area of the world, completely overshadowed by the gigantic surrounding empires, in that tiny area which was called Palestine, he produced universal values. I meant when I said that he didn't use universal terms, that he didn't use those terms which elsewhere didn't have to refer to the language, to the people, to its history, but could, by referring only to the landscape, give an echo of that which created the people. The Jewish universalist values after the Bible were concentrated in intellectual content, in custom, in ritual, in faith, in history, in fidelity, and not in the world of nature. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Samuel. Now, uh, 
before you leave, I wonder whether I may have one minute of your time. We'd like to find out how effective the various devices of communication that we use are. In other words, we'd like to know how you happen to be here. So I'd like to ask one or two questions. Would you raise your hands in response? How many people are here because they saw an advertisement in the New York Times? Would you raise your hand? Let's see. All right. How many? All right, down. Thank you. How many are here because they received a letter as members of the Y? Raise your hands. Uh, how many are here because they were here last year and thus knew about this program? Is there any other method? Oh, New York Post. I'm sorry. How many are here through the New York Post? Any other reasons? Yes, I believe they were. How many are here because... How, uh, how many were notified because they were uh, uh, present at last year's omnibus program? Let's raise your hand and see. Well, these people evidently were notified. Now there's another question. I'd like to get geographical distribution, and you may be interested in this too. How many here are from Brooklyn? Uh, <laughs> how many are here from Manhattan? Uh, down, thank you. How many are here from the Bronx? How many are here from Queens? <laughs> Staten Island? How many are here from outside the limits of New York City? I wonder how far. <laughs> Where are you from? Jersey City. And anyone else further? Westchester. Anyone, any other place? That's fine. Now, a big pardon. Mr. Kolodny, where are you from? From Minsk. <laughs> well, and then now there's one last question, which I don't think you can answer uh, this way, but perhaps afterwards, after everyone leaves, those that are interested in discussing this with us might come forward. We're interested in conducting these programs so that as many people as possible have an opportunity to participate and so that these uh, discussions can be of greatest value to the people who come. Now, these groups aren't so large that we can't perhaps create a more informal atmosphere or if there's any other way that you think this kind of discussion can be carried on to be of greater value to those who are here, we'd like to know about it. W would anyone want to say anything about that at this point? Yes? Uh -huh. Fine. All right. Any other suggestions? Uh, the point you are making is that some notes be prepared and mimeographed for those people who come so that they can refer to it afterwards. Is that the point you're making? How many are in favor of that? Well, I see a job being cut out for somebody here. <laughs> uh, all right, that seems to meet with everyone's approval. Is there any other uh, suggestion that someone would like to make? A little more air. A little more air. <laughs> any other? Yes? In addition to that many grants, some, uh, perhaps some uh, suggestions as to what you could do. Uh, uh, a suggested bibliography. All right, that seems to be good. Any other suggestions besides closing the meeting? What's that? How many are in favor? How many are in favor of a class in Yiddish or Yiddish literature or some subject related to Yiddish. Raise your hands. Let's see. Beg pardon? Who? <laughs> Someone here suggested if we conduct the class, if uh, Mr. Samuel conducts the class, he'll come. Yes. 
With explanations in English? All right. How many would attend a series of readings in Yiddish by Mr. Samuel? Let's see. All right. All right, we've got a... All right, thank you very much. And now, I think I've tried your patience more than I should. And uh, I hope that we see you at the next one, which is November 22nd, Dr. Halkin. Jewish values as reflected in Hebrew Jewish literature. Thank you and good night. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org. 